Thank you. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Without him, there probably would not be a need act or a bill introduced into Congress. Uh, before the bill is introduced, it must go through the Legislative Council. And Jim was very big in helping get this thing written into the right language and introduced. So please welcome Jim Ward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and Welcome everyone. Um, I, in looking for a topic title today, you know, uh, Jamie asked me what it, what it is that I wanted to talk about, and what came to me loud and clear was to talk about what is real. And that has a lot of ways into the topic. Um, Talk louder, okay. I'm just not being picked up. Am I being picked up in the mic? A little bit. Yeah, that's a little bit. Okay, let me just. Is there a volume on it? I'll just play it. The volume's underneath. No, it's, I think it's over underneath the thing. I haven't had a chance. Not a word. <laughs> so, one of the things, one of the ways into this topic came up yesterday afternoon when um, we were all talking about storytelling. And it came to me that that would be a way to, 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 to work our way into this topic. And I'm just going to cover this. Uh, it's been written that stories configure human nature. It's in our nature to need stories. We arrive in the world biologically prepared for the stories. They are evolutionary, evolutionarily crucial, and we think in story logic. Like our language instinct, a story drive is inborn hunger to hear and make stories, and it emerges untutored. That every culture bathes its children in stories. Story patterns are like another type of grammar. It shapes the way we think about the world and our institutions. And the stories free us from limits of direct experience. So we don't have to have the feeling if we, get, if we understand the story. So what does that have to do with monetary policy and monetary reform and the quote, real world? I've, in part, the way I'm thinking more recently about all of what we've been involved in, and it also has to do with you know, what I think about where, we should, you know, where, where I can participate in going forward, is to step back and begin to realize that evolution is a constant change and our political and economic system is always constantly changing. And, yet, and in order to understand it, we create stories about what is real, what is our experience. And the stories tend to stay constant, constant, maybe generational. And what's happening now, that all of you have been talking about and experiencing is that the story of the way things are, whether it's, you know, climate change or monetary policy or just about our health care, health, the health system, is, is, is outstripped, the, that what is does not fit the story of what we were told that it is. And there is, and monetary policy is one that's steeped in uh, a lot of mythology, a lot of stories. Just the way that all of you, Benjamin Franklin, John, were describing the what the way the monetary system works. I mean, who knew? Right? It's not the stories we were told about the way that it is. That's one of the reasons when we have trying to stand in front of people and explain what the monetary system is and you know how it's affecting us, it's like, what? Yeah. It's not real for them. Because it's not it doesn't it doesn't contribute to the way that the story that, that they've organized. And this is to me it's really fundamental. I watched this TED talk recently 
Um, I think I have a person's name here who, who gave it. He's a neuroscientist at the University of Sus Sussex, Sackler Center for Consciousness Science. And it's a research that bridges neuroscience, mathematics, artificial intelligence, computer science, psychology, philosophy, and psychiatry into an examination of the way the consciousness experiences both the world and the self. And the thing that I thought was really interesting about his work is that he also works with playwrights, dancers, and other artists to understand consciousness. And that just came, that came up yesterday afternoon beautifully in, in, in your presentation. That um, we, it, it's necessary. But one of the things he said was that the brain is just, you know, flesh encompassed in a bony, dark structure that knows nothing. And it receives a stream of sensory information from the eyes, from the taste, from the ears, from everything, which in itself doesn't mean anything. And it's not what's actually out there, it's the perception that's coming into the brain, and the brain creates the pictures, the story of what it is that it's receiving, and it's doing that in large part based on what it expects to see. And that's so that we are constantly creating our reality through our what we expect to see, which is our story of the way the world is. And so what he would, what his point ultimately was that when you stop to think about how we experience the conscious world outside of ourselves, is that it's really a, a, a kind of controlled hallucination. That we're all experiencing something based on what we expect to see, and information, sensory data that doesn't conform to that is discarded from the brain. So we never get to experience what it is, and that when we, when all of us agree on what our particular hallucination is, that is the, that is the received reality. Reality is really where we all can agree what our own hallucinations present. So this is all could maybe seem far-fetched to you, but it's kind of like, you know, I spent all those years in the hill, and I also spent a lot of time meditating and doing, you know, kundalini yoga and all kinds of things of practice of, with different people for many years. So I'm kind of like accustomed to both being considered different and, um, walking in several worlds at the same time. So when I look at the, at the world of money and money, monetary reform, I'm also really um, interested in how, you know, how we, re how we receive this. I spent um, a weekend about a year and a half ago with someone um, by the name of, uh, I'm not sure I can pronounce his name, his name is Louis Bertelink. He's a Dutchman who lives in Scotland, has lived in Scotland for many years, and he's written a book called The Dare to Care, How to Create a Love-Based Economy. And he had a weekend experiential workshop that I participated, participated in as a facilitator. And, um, was called Meeting the Mystery of Money. And one of some of the things that we explored in this, it was a small group, and we and, a, and, a, and we developed a tight container doing a lot of the kind of work that uh, Mary Bo led, led us in yesterday, the, the feelings work. And ultimately, we had to meet the God of Money which was me, <laughs> and, um, and confront that aspect of it. Let me see if I can just quickly look at some of the questions that we, that we asked. Okay, so the first question that each person had to go into deep and feel was, feel your fears in relationship to money and find your deepest fear. What is your deepest fear about money? And just some of the stories were just amazing when people came to share. The mother who was 
fleeing overnight from a bad experience and had her young children in the car and lost her credit card for some reason and was stuck trying to get gas and just felt completely left out of the monetary system at that point. Desperate and just wasn't there. So that and the fear that came up around what was going to happen to her, what was going to happen to her children. Um, Feel your despair in relation to money. Well, there was some despair in that too, as probably. And tell us your most desperate moment around fear, around money. Go towards hate and anger. Have you ever experienced any hate or anger toward the monetary system? And how does how does that feel in your body when you think about the monetary system? What is the deepest pain you feel in your life with money? And then, do you have any other issues with money? And when we go into this, <clears throat> the, the, the emotional experience that each of us has around money, and we think about <clears throat> the stories of, you know, that we heard from our parents, what was, what was your father's attitude around money? We know what Joe's father attitude. He taught his son, well, um, <clears throat> what's your mother's attitude about money? How did it play out in your life? And does your belief about money work for you? So that was a fascinating experience. And what it, what it helped me realize was how deeply we all carry emotions around money. And that when we are in, in, in working with groups of people, and trying to enlighten them to how the system works and what it is that we can do on a political and economic basis to, <clears throat> to reform the system, it's really important, I think, to keep in mind that the stories that people are carrying at a very deep, deep level are being impacted by what we're asking them to look at. Just mentioning money. It's like money is kind of, in some ways, one of the deepest secrets that we still carry about our personal experience. It used to be that the, your, your monetary position and your, and, and your sexual activities were both kind of like nothing, something you didn't talk about. And, and now they're saying that really it's only money. It's the last big taboo. You don't talk about how in debt you are with your friends. You don't talk about you know, how much wealth you have. Maybe, maybe the boasters talk a little bit about it, but you don't talk about how, what the struggle is that you have. How you're meeting all those interest payments for all the stuff that you know has come up. Um, so I think you know it's important to to keep that in mind. Another thing about what is real for me also has to do with well, it kind of comes up when we start to hear all the stories about what is what is fake and what is fake news and fake this and fake that. And everybody kind of puts that label on it now. Um, and then it, at, at the same time, we start, we realize that a lot of the stories that we've been told about, even about money, or, or uh, is just a story that has benefited someone. I mean, uh, in, the, in, the, in the area of uh, medical research, for example, it's just like, to me, it's astounding that both the Dr. Uh, Richard Horton, who's the director of, who's the editor of The Lancet, which is like the leading medical journal in the UK, and uh, now retired Marcia Engel, who is uh, retired as the, as the chief editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and she's now on the faculty of Harvard Medical School, both have <coughs> said that it's really no longer possible to believe much of the clinical research that's published. Or to rely on the judgments of trusted physicians or authoritative medical guidelines. And the angle said, I take no pleasure in this conclusion, which I received slowly and reluctantly over my two decades as an editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. It's money. The money system has corrupted the pure science in some respect. I mean, and that's what some people mean about it you know, what is, what is fake. It's just, um, it's not reliable. Um, 
it was mentioned in, I think Ben Franklin mentioned it, you know, that they're taking the, using the stock market as a guide to economic health. Brian Eisler wrote a good book on the real wealth of nations, which is, you know, really a whole discussion about how the economic system does not value what is really important both for the environment and for the society. Um, Paul Craig Roberts, if you have, I know that uh, Mark has written and, and, uh, written and read and written things about him. He was uh, Assistant Secretary of the Treasury when under, the, under Ronald Reagan in the second term in the late 80s, and then he went on to become an editor at the Wall Street Journal for a number of years in the 90s, and he's been writing sort of from beyond the pale uh, about, well, just, you know, I'll, I'll come back to him in one second, because it just reminded me the way that we have the story that a two-party political system is the best for everybody, okay? I mean, where did we receive that? We always hear about that, you know? And when John Anderson ran against Reagan, it was like, oh my God, this is really the end of it. And Ross Perot threw the election to Clinton from George Bush's second term because he ran as a third party. And, you know, what did Ralph Nader do with, uh, with in, in 2000, which is an election? I mean, we don't really know the story on what that election was, do we? Um, and, and at the same time, the same thing happened in this last election. This, and, you know, I know a lot of you people that are associated with the Green Party have run into this all the time. It's like they're considered to be the spoilers. And yet, why is it that, it, how did we get to that story? How did we get to the story that corporations are people, for example? They weren't originally considered to be that. Uh, they weren't originally considered to have any say in in the political process, they were an investment feature, uh, a mechanism for, for going forward for specific purposes. And so these have all evolved, and the, and the two-party system was one. It, uh, and admittedly, a multi-party system can be messy. We always had, you know, you can always look at sort of the messy parts of some of European politics. Um, and yet there were, yet there was, uh, um, we look at, there's no geometric structure, for example, that has stability with only two points. With a line, it's a line, it's not even a structure. You, in order to have a solid base, you need at least a three-legged stool, right? Or a four-legged chair, or, you know, geodesic dome or whatever. So multiple points create a more inclusive story, and the two-party system is really part of the story that we were led to believe, because it's we're more easily controlled when we just have two. And you're, you're, you're led into one, and the others are the bad guys, and boom, you can just keep going that way. <clears throat> Paul Craig Roberts is somebody who was part of the Republican system, but he writes a lot um, about what the story really is. And one of them was in, in April, I'm gonna make sure I don't go over here. It was in April, he wrote more fake news from Washington, and this time it's about employment. So it's, you know, the U.S. government continues to lie about everything, not just this, you know, his foreign policy stuff, which is also very, but it's, it's incapable of telling the truth about something as straightforward as employment. And how did that happen? That, you know, it says March produced only 98,000 new payroll jobs, an insufficient amount to reduce employment, but the unemployment rate fell from 4.7 to 4.5. How did that happen? Not because unemployed found jobs, the unemployment rate fell because the government doesn't count most of the unemployed. The only, they only count unemployed those people who've been looking for work for four weeks. So if you're looking for work for more than four weeks, you're not part of the unemployment rate. So when, they, when you read the rate, that the rate's going down, it's just that the rate has gone down around people who are not currently working, who are looking for work and have only been looking for work for less than four weeks. So there's all these different levels of, of there's, there's this great scheme, and I'm not going to get into that. There's a skit that's based on um, the old uh, who's on first routine. Do you, ever, do you ever see that one about employment and, and uh, unemployed, the unemployed and the, 
the unemployed and the un unemployed. I mean, it's, it's like not working and being unemployed, and it's like who's on first? This whole skit that goes back and forth between them. It's like, what's the unemployment rate? You know, well, it's five percent. How many are not employed? Oh, well, that's like forty percent. <laughs> <laughs> but you said unemployment rate. Yeah, well, that's the unemployment rate, and then it, it, it goes on. And the, of course, the punchline is that you know the who's on first kind of thing. Uh, punchline for this for this particular joke is like. Oh, I get it, because ah, now you're thinking like an economist. And the other guy goes, oh, yeah, then you're thinking like a politician. <laughs> it's, the, it's the, we have this, these storylines that we don't even understand the basis for them. Um, so as we go forward, and I do want to, talk a little bit about how we can let me just tell you another another couple of stories. This is you know this may seem even more bizarre to you because there's something else I do besides um, thinking about monetary reform and current policy and how to reform the system and how we got here, which is I lead kick out ceremonies and my wife and I do all kinds of sort of some of you might consider it voodoo kinds of things. We have gatherings and we meditate and chant and uh, go on shamanic journeys and find out who is wanting to bring us messages. And one of the one of the things we use is uh, um, is cacao that we import from Guatemala from a friend of ours who lives down there who collects it from indigenous people. That's the wild variety. Cacao is really the basis for chocolate. The English at some point. English chocolate company changed cacao to cocoa, and the rest of the world knows it as cocoa, but cacao is the bean. And when he started, when my friend Keith started, his, all, his involvement of it began with dreams and what he calls, you know, intuitive understandings, and he just started reaching out and using it in his healing practice. It's, it's the basis for chocolate, and it's very, very rich, has lots of minerals, lots of nutrients. Anyway, he got contacted one day, um, a message came to him, and he asked his friend, he said, what's going on here? And the friend said, oh, this is an indigenous group that lives like three and a half mountain ranges over toward the Pacific. Keith is up on Lake Atilam. And um, it's going to be a hike to get there because they live in an area with no roads. They're they don't allow anybody in because they've realized, so a lot of the indigenous groups in Costa Rica and Guatemala have realized that if they let people in, government people, whatever, even anthropologists, that sooner their kids get captured by the, by the spell and they take them away to school and then they wind up in the cities and their whole little community is gone. So, this is one such group. He said, it's going to take you a while to get there because there are no roads over there. You're going to need to go by four-wheel drive as far as you can get, then horseback, and then you're going to have to hike through the jungle. So it took him you know, a good day to get there. When he got there, they just brought him in around the fire, the elders. And they're just sitting around the fire. The way he tells the story, it moves me every time, is that they just tuned into him. And I don't know if you and quite understand what I mean by that, but they just, they just, they didn't say anything, there was no verbal communication, but they were reading his experience. They, were, they knew what he was, they knew who he was. And finally, uh, one of the elders across the fire spoke and said, we understand, he never said how he understood, but he said, we understand you're using our sacred beverage, we'd like to know your intent, your sacred product. So Keith told him that he's been using it in his healing practice, that he found that it really helped people move through pain and open up to, to different things, and that it was just a very useful tool, experience, for what he was doing in his healing practice. And the elders looked at it, and they just went back to silence. They were just sitting there around the fire, and then the elders said, well, where have you been? We've been waiting for someone to have this level of experience for several hundred years. Because there's a, there's, a, there's a Mayan 
Aztec, Toltec, Olmec legend, that when humanity gets too far separated from nature, that we have this illusion that we can dominate everything else that exists and that we're not really a part of it, but we are superior to it and different from it and we can manipulate it and even own it. What a concept that is. Own things that have been in the ground for two million years already, right? Um, that cacao will come from the jungle to restore the balance. And that's just one aspect. That's that legend. Um, but it, it's a, it was a very powerful moment. It was another time he uh, was called to another group the same way and same rigmarole to get there by the time he got there. He couldn't leave right away, so when he did get there, the young people came running out of the... I mean, these are small communities. We're not talking very large groups. These are people that breathe and live and eat and do everything together. Um, the elders weren't there, and they said, well, they're down in our sacred cave, so he started running down with them to, through the jungle to the sacred cave, and behold, just a few minutes later, the, they met the people coming back up, the elders, and the elders explained that there was a dispute with another group a few miles, kilometers away, however far it was. They didn't ever say what it was, but the, the, the elders of each group went into their respective sacred caves, 30, say 30 kilometers apart, and they had a discussion about what the basis for the differences were and a full and frank discussion of what possible solutions were and an agreement. Now, to, to us, this seems totally bizarre, right? Um, but it's their reality. And it was the reality of a lot of indigenous people. The English were landed in Australia. They were totally astounded that the shamans there among the aboriginals could communicate over hundreds of miles. And that they did. And they would have English people at each end of it who recorded the conversation. And they spoke through the fire. The English wound up calling it the Mulga wire because it seemed like an invisible telegraph that ran through the Mulga wood that they were burning as part of their trance. Um, and in, in the same way with uh, with these indigenous elders. So there's there's a there's a part of the of the of, the, of the, what is real that's working for me is to realize that a lot of what we were told about what is real about the way we organize the way. We feel the way the stories we tell about the natural world that we feel separate from that. That we can take, a, a, create a fiction of a corporation, which is just a piece of paper after all. We created that reality from, from nothing, the same way we created the money and called it a corporation and gave them another piece of paper that says they own the oil in this spot and they own the oil in that spot and that they can not only produce the oil, but sell it to you at a profit and keep you working to earn more money through debt to, to pay for it. And that, that it actually now has distorted the way we have organized our energy production because there's a monetary incentive to keep paying for things that we've given the ownership of to something that isn't real without converting to much more natural, safe, and free forms of energy production. I mean, Germany is producing, you know, over half of their, of their resources now. The United States led in the production of solar and wind energy, and now it's largely China and Germany. And we're way behind the ball on that, and we keep people working. How many days a week do you work to pay for energy, to pay for? utilities to pay for things that uh, I'm, you're not talking to the choir here because you guys are, have much more background in some of the ideas of commons and everything than I do. Anyway, these are just sort of the random thoughts of somebody who has worked on the inside. I mean, what is the Federal Reserve? Is that any more real than anything else? They can't even agree on what they are. I mean, I've told you that story before. They rely on their independence on a letter that FDR sent to somebody, and they keep it in a drawer down there. And that's the basis for the fact that they consider themselves independent of the civil service of the United States. So, I mean, I've been part of discussions between the General Counsel of the Federal Reserve and 
members of Congress on what are they? What are you? <laughs> Nobody knows, right? <laughs> so anyway, keep on, keep the faith, and just do it. Keep it real, brother. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.